Well, good evening. What a blessing to be back here at Skyline. I always feel very much at home here. Um, I don't know where I'm going to put this. Hang on just a second here. I'm going to lay it over to the side. Maybe I won't need it. Um, it's always a blessing. I, I feel so at home here. And uh, we have uh, dear friends here. Uh, folks that uh, I, I used to pastor, and what a blessing that is, and it's always good to see them. Uh, it's good to see Carol and Shirley uh, here with us, uh, over here sitting beside my wife. The Carol and Shirley are easy to spot. Well, they're not the only black folk in here tonight. We got some more black folk in here, hallelujah. So I like, I like when Baptist churches uh, get a little color, amen? So... Uh, Please don't be offended, y'all. I mean, I, I aggravate Carol all the time about being the only black person in the service, but, but we have some others tonight. So anyway, shame on me. I didn't see y'all back there. Um, anyway, it's always good to, to see Carol and Shirley. They are such a blessing in our lives. He's been on our ministry board, uh, and uh, we started uh, the ministry back in 2004. I left a, a church, and we traveled and preached for nine years. Uh, I say we because it's been the Lord and me and my wife Cindy who's sitting there with Carol and Shirley uh, tonight and I thank God for her being with me. She don't get to travel with me always but uh, she's here tonight so it's a blessing and so we, uh, we traveled for a long time and over the years I served uh, interim, uh, I, I served in eight or nine interim positions in churches and I had churches that would talk to me about staying and that sort of thing. So we ended up at Oak Grove Baptist. And um, as an interim, I went over there as their interim pastor and um, stayed, you know, I mean, we were there a while and they approached me, the search committee did, about staying. And I told them no the first time. And then uh, they approached me uh, again in a more formal way, officially, as a search committee. And ask if I would at least, uh, Cindy and I would at least pray about it. So we prayed about a month or so and ended up staying and that's where we are now. I'm the pastor there and uh, they let me uh, have some freedom and flexibility to do these meetings. So uh, uh, to do as many meetings as I, I can and uh, uh, or do a lot of meetings. So anyway, that's kind of where we are up to date. And uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, some of you know me, and um, if you don't know me, that's okay. Uh, what's more important is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can leave here and never see me again, and you've not lost anything, friend. But if you leave here without Christ, and you never have another opportunity to meet Jesus, you've lost everything. So uh, I assure you uh, that I'm not important. I must decrease, and He must increase. May we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in our in our midst tonight, I love uh, your pastor. He's got such a sweet spirit. He's very kind and meek and mild, and, um, and 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 in a very good and positive way. And I just he is such a sweet man, a blessing to be around. And so I want to just thank him for another opportunity to share here at Skyline. The song was beautiful, y'all. I appreciate the song so much. Uh, and all the singing was good tonight. Um, Canaan's Fair Land, I, I like that. Uh, just over in Canaan's Land, that's an old song we've sang at ye for years in my home church. I grew up in a dead Baptist church. Y'all know what that is? That's, that describes most of them, uh, unfortunately. Especially in our day, we've got a lot of deadness in our Baptist churches across the country. But... Uh, so it's good to see a little life, good to see you clapping, good to see you saying amen, that's nice, I like to see some life. But I grew up in a dead Baptist church that God made alive again. Uh, I'm telling you right now, uh, we got so wild at one point, we had, an, we had a revival that lasted for seven years in our church, I mean sustained revival. We saw our church grow to over 300 in attendance. We saw families saved. We saw people physically healed. We saw uh, a number of things happen. We got so wild, we scared the charismatics off. And, uh, and, and you know, nobody, uh, there was no speaking in tongues. There was no charismatic practice in our church. Although we were so wild, I tell people that if somebody had brought a serpent, somebody would have probably handled it. So... Uh, in fact, the first time I ever took Cindy there, I had to warn her. And there were, we had this box that sat on the communion table. 
And uh, it was a box where you put your birthday money in. Y'all know what they did? I don't know why Baptists make people pay on their birthday. We ought to be giving you money on your birthday, but we make them pay. We do it in our church at Oak Grove, and it goes to missions. The money goes to missions. So anyway, it's a great cause, and that was the same. I don't remember exactly what, what we used the money for at Zion, but, but that box would sit there, and you, it was very nondescript. You couldn't really tell what it was by it just being there on the table. And so we went in church, and I, I warned her. I said, now look, I'm going to tell you right now, it gets wild around here sometimes. And I mean, y'all think I'm joking, but honey, I mean to tell you, uh, they, it was nothing to see 50 people on the floor shouting and, and praising the Lord. I've seen them take running spells, and I've seen services that lasted three hours. I mean, uh, it was nothing unusual for us to have uh, stuff like that go on. So I warned her ahead of time. Anyway, we're sitting there, and... And uh, she looks at me and says, what's that box on the communion table? And I said, you mean you don't know? I'm dead serious. She said, no, I don't know. I said, well, that's where we keep the snakes. <laughs> I thought she was going to run out of the building. People, people tell me, and you know, I go up north or I've traveled a little bit outside of East Tennessee in the Appalachian region, and people ask me about the snake handlers, and I say, absolutely. I'm, I, I said, they're misguided folk, but I said there's one thing about them. They're very serious. You go picking up copperheads and rattlesnakes, honey, you better be serious. You better know the Lord's all I can tell you because <clears throat> you might meet him, you know. Uh, the brother on the TV show met the Lord here just uh, not long ago. Uh, he died from snake bite. Anyhow, enough about that. Take your Bibles and turn with me tonight to the book of Romans. I'm going to have to preach and quit fooling around here. Romans chapter 12. I like the weekend format, Pastor. We've experimented with that over the years in itinerant ministry. Uh, you know, Sunday through Wednesday revivals are difficult to maintain in our modern world. People are very busy and there's so much going on, it's very difficult to sustain Sunday through Wednesday meetings like we have over the years. And so one way is to explore with different formats and experiment. We've done that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday meetings in the past. I've done several of them. I did one... Uh, out in Mississippi, and uh, my dear friend Alan McCullough was a pastor there of a church just north, just a little ways north of Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, we did a weekend meeting there, and it was uh, a, a wonderful experience. There were people in that church that uh, were family members, relatives of Jerry Clower, and I got to have lunch with them, and, and, and Jerry Clower was always a big hero of mine. I, I always loved his comedy, and, and he was a believer in Jesus, and uh, and there was also people in that church that had been in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Now, most people may or may not like that movie. I don't know how you feel about it, but it happens to be a favorite of Cindy and myself. We, we love the movie. And I was never a George Clooney fan until that movie. So I got to meet some of the people that were in the movie and, uh, and the church was there. Uh, the town square that you see in the movie was right there. Uh, where the church was, and uh, it was very uh, interesting uh, time. So I like this format. I like being told what to preach. No, pastor didn't tell me that, but we do have a theme for tonight. And the theme, which actually I do like. Now, that don't always happen. You know, sometimes pastors will, will give me a theme or whatever and a kind of general direction, and that's fine. I, I got no problem with that. Uh, it makes my job easier, to be honest with you. And this happened to be uh, a subject that, I, that is dear to my heart. But I want to share a message with you tonight, simply entitled, I Surrender All. I Surrender All. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul is nearing the end of this magnificent book. He's talked a lot about doctrine and theology. And now he starts to really get down to where, as I like to say, religion meets the road. You know, the old saying, where the rubber meets the road, this is it. This is where religion meets the road. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Notice that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A.W. Tozer is a hero of mine as well. I have many heroes of the faith. Tozer belonged to the Christian Missionary Alliance. He was not an educated man, did not have advanced degrees from college or seminary. He was self-taught. If he didn't understand something, he would get down on his knees and read and pray. He read the entire works of Shakespeare on his knees. He was an unusual man. He was a man upon whom anointed anointing rested in his life and ministry. He was an exceptional servant of Christ. You know what he said? And I quote, The reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they have not yet come to the end of themselves. Now I've thought much about revival in recent years. In fact, our ministry when we started in 04 was dedicated and devoted to the mission of proclaiming the message of revival in the local church calling people back to God, calling them to return to their first love, calling them to repent, calling them to those things that would certainly position us for revival to come in our modern world. Most people think it's not going to happen. There's always the naysayers that say it can't be done. It's never going to happen. We'll never see those days like you saw 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years ago and 100 years ago. The great awakenings down through time, all these great revivals, all the great revivals of Scripture. Uh, we'll never see those days again. Well, as long as we maintain that attitude, we've not come to the end of ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can truly come to the end of yourself and surrender, Surrender to God, that's the place where God can really begin to work in your life and your church and even in our entire area. I've thought much about revival, what it's going to take to experience revival. And I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I think I know where we must start. As Tozer said, we must come to the end of ourselves. We must come to a place of full surrender. Andrew Murray, the great uh, writer, uh, talked of the one great need of the church being absolute surrender to God. He said, one condition for obtaining God's full blessing is absolute surrender to Him. And I happen to agree with him, ladies and gentlemen. So Paul, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, sets down the standard for us. We could call this uh, our Christian manifesto. We could call it our declaration of intentions. And that is to have a constant and complete surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be our creed. Moment by moment obedience, day by day surrender. I want you to notice with me tonight several points that we draw from the passage. First of all, look with me at the call to surrender. The call to surrender. Paul calls us to a life of surrender. He uses this old English language. I beseech you. He says, I beseech you, I plead with you. It is a pleading, if you will, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. It is a call to surrender. Now the imagery here is almost ironic in the sense that a sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen, was always what? Put to death, right? That's the whole point of it being a sacrifice. It was giving its life for some other purpose, for some other reason. It was giving its life, if you will, for someone else. It was a sacrifice. A sacrifice was always put to death, yet Paul calls us to be living sacrifices. What on earth could he mean? I, he says we must die and yet live and he says, we must live and yet die. It is to recognize that we are to go on living in these bodies, but realizing that we are not our own. We are bought with a price. We belong to God. It echoes the call of Christ in Luke 9, 23. He said, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that the people that first heard those words knew exactly what he was saying to them. He was calling them to die. He said, take up your cross. Now, many of them faced physical death. They would have to give their lives for their faith. In fact, all of the original disciples, now Judas, we know, took his own life. 
but the 11 and then Matthias who was chosen and then on down even uh, dealing with Paul uh, as essentially one of the apostles born out of due time. All of the apostles except John died for their faith. They tried to kill John on numerous occasions and he managed to escape and live to be an old man in the city of Ephesus. He was so old and feeble and crippled that they used to carry him in on a stretcher and that old bony hand would hang over the side and as they would, pull it, as they would carry him down the aisle of the church at Ephesus, he would point his finger at all of them up in his 90s. He would say to them, love one another, love one another. Oh, they all died for their faith. Maybe uh, we will never have to experience that. Most of us probably won't. We are blessed to live in a country of freedom, although that freedom is starting to sink below the tide of our times. Uh, we are living on a sea, ladies and gentlemen, of unbelievable uh, sin and compromise with the world. Uh, and nobody seems to be standing up for what's right and true. And we face something new every day. Some new compromise. Some new constraint upon us. I'm convinced that the old ship of Zion is getting ready to sail through uncharted waters. The church will soon perhaps experience persecution unlike we have ever known and never known in America, ladies and gentlemen. So I don't know, you may have to die for your faith. When Cassie Bernal got up that morning and went to that school there in Colorado, she had no idea somebody would put a gun in her face and say, if you deny Christ, I'll let you live. She would not deny Christ. And the Klebo boy pulled the trigger and took her life. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't know. I, I hope and pray you never have to face that. But listen, there are probably more people dying for their faith right now in the world than at any time in history. It's dangerous to be a Christian. It's getting more dangerous in this country, I want you to know. You can't say anything. My problem is I want to say everything. I tell them at Oak Grove all the time, I said, you never know when somebody will come here Somebody will complain about me. I may say something that might be construed as harsh or even hate speech or something else. Now, I don't, I don't do that. I really don't. Now, listen, sin is sin to me, friend. I don't care what you are. I don't care what you've done. Every sin, all sin was nailed to the cross. All sin can be forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. I preach mercy and grace and hope, but I want you to know I'm going to stand for what's right as long as I can stand. So, it is a call to die and yet live, to live and yet die. Deny self, die to self. I don't know whether we will ever experience that of having to be, make a choice to live or die for our faith. I hope you don't. But yet Paul still calls us to die to self, to deny ourselves. It is a call to surrender. Now that runs counter to the culture today. It runs counter to the anthem of our age, which says we must seek to please ourselves and pleasure ourselves. Even in the church, we're not immune to this because Often it seems that everything is geared toward pleasing people. You know, we are constantly concerned with making people comfortable and making our programs convenient. There's little in the way of calling people to selfless, sacrificial surrender. And yet, that call still goes forth. You want to know why nobody's preaching the Bible? Nobody's living the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, to tell you right now, this stuff slaps you across the face and sends you to the altar in repentance and sends you to God in prayer because you know you can't do this within yourself. The only way to live the Christian life is to let Christ live through you. And that involves surrender. That involves letting God have it. Oh, my dear friends, think about it now. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Have you come to a place of surrender? Do you want to come to a place of surrender? And you may ask me why. Listen, I've asked myself this question. I've studied this passage for years. And I ask myself why. Why would somebody want to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'm going to give you the reason right here. We've seen the call to surrender, but notice the reason. In these verses, in these verses Paul says, 
by the mercies of God. That's the King James translation. In other translations it reads like this. Because of the mercies of God. We should surrender every day because of the abounding mercy of God toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Where sin left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Hallelujah. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His mercy, He has saved us. God's mercy should be our motivation. C.T. Studd, who was wealthy and educated and could have been anything in life, he decided to follow the call of God upon his life. He went to the darkest points of Africa as a missionary many years ago. Even standing on the docks in England, people were pleading with him not to go. He'd been a sports hero. He'd been many things. Could have had a, a pleasurable life. A life absolutely of ease and wealth. He decided to go to Africa. He stood on the dock and looked at them and said, Listen, if Christ be God and died for me, no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. Ladies and gentlemen, the provision of Christ is our motivation. And the person of Christ is our example. Jesus who took upon himself the form of a bondservant, thinking himself not to be equal with God, uh, became in the flesh, you know, just like us, ladies and gentlemen. Now, he was God in the flesh, yes, but he was man as well. He was just as much man as if he were not God. He was just as much God as if he were not man. He was the God-man. He was unique, the only begotten of God. He came down here and showed us the way. People ask me why I do what I do. Listen, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've been forgiven of. I know where I've been in my life. My sin is as black as a thousand midnights. I want you to know, uh, but hallelujah, when he sees me, he sees the blood, thank God. Uh, the blood, the blood has washed away my sin. <laughs> I'm telling you, just, uh, I don't know, uh, hold on is all I can tell you. My mules may get loose in this place here in a moment. I only know one way to preach, honey. That's heaven bound with the hammer down, wide slam open. That's all I know. My daddy used to tell me, Cheryl, if you're not wringing wet with sweat when you get done, you've not really preached. That'll bless you on the way into a church service. He'd say to me after I get done, sometimes, that's a nice talk. That's a nice talk. Great. Day in the morning, boy, it didn't get too wild for him, son. Just lay it down. Just lay it down. Listen, Paul uses the word in Philippians 2. The Greek word doulos, bondservant. Christ took upon himself the form of a bondservant, bond slave. Christ became a slave to the Father's will. Our example is none other than Jesus himself. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We're Christ's. I've been working on a message for a long time. The title of the message is Choose Your Chains. Listen, we're all in bondage to something. Most people in bondage to the world and the world system. It has absolutely captivated them. Not only that, it has absolutely captured them and their soul. The Bible says, what if you gained the whole world and lost your own soul? What would you give in exchange? Oh, you need to choose your chains tonight, friends. We're all chained to something. I'm telling you right now, I want to be chained to Christ. I want people to see Jesus in me. Cheryl Knave is insignificant. Cheryl Knave is inferior. Cheryl Knave does not matter. You can, as I said before, leave here and never see me again and you've lost nothing. But if you leave without Christ and you never meet Him again, my friend, you've lost everything. I want to be chained to Christ, a slave to His will, His way, His word. Christ came and showed us the way, and not only that, he paid for the trip. He paid for the trip. Let me tell you something. I have been bought with a price. 
not of corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Drops of blood that fell from Calvary's cross, staining the sand beneath. That's the blood that washed away my sins and made me whole again and made me free. Oh, hallelujah. For this reason alone, Paul says, because of the mercy of God toward you, you should live your life for Him. Leonard Ravenhill, who's a hero, thank God he's dead now because most churches couldn't stand him. Nowadays, anybody? Well, I better hush. Ravenhill said, Lord, engage my heart today with a passion that will not pass away. Torch it with holy fire that never more shall earth's desire invade or quench the heaven-born power. I would be trapped within thy holy will, thine every holy purpose to fulfill, that every effort of my life shall bring rapturous, rapturous praise to my eternal King. I pledge from this day to the grave to be thine own unquestioning slave. You don't hear much like that today, do you? We hear a lot of stuff, you know, fluff and shallow, you know, stuff. Think about that. I pledge from this day to the grave to be thine own unquestioning slave. My friend, you're not going to hear that much on TBN. That's not going to make the top 10 list of most Christian programs, I'll tell you right now. But oh my, we wonder where the power's gone in our churches. We wonder why we don't see people say. We wonder why church has, attendance has declined in America for 25 years. We have embraced a compromising message. We're not pointing people to the cross. We're not calling people to surrender. We're not calling people to turn from their sin and turn from the Savior, Jesus Christ. We have left and we have lost the power of God in our day. Oh, we can draw a crowd, but we can't draw the fire of heaven to fall. Paul issued the call. He reminds us of the reason why we should surrender because of His mercy toward us. And finally, I want you to notice, he talks about the results or the benefits of surrender. Paul says the ultimate end of a surrendered life will be, notice what he said in verse 2, knowing and realizing the perfect and pleasing will of God in our lives. Knowing and realizing the perfect and pleasing will of God in our lives. These verses, particularly, well, both of them really, they indicate that if we resolve to surrender our lives and renew our minds, while at the same time refusing to conform to worldly standards, we will experience the transforming power of God in our lives. Do you know what the Greek word Tra or the English word transformed is translated from the Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis, which represents the change from, from what? The caterpillar to the butterfly, right? You see, that's a miracle. See, that's why salvation is a miracle. Salvation is not something that happens just to you. It's something that happens in you. And if you are Christ, you've been saved by His marvelous grace. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you're a Baptist or not. I don't believe in eternal security because I'm a Baptist. I believe it's what the Bible teaches. I believe that we are saved by His grace. We are born from above. It is a transformation that takes place within our heart. It results in outward behavior and transformation. Yes, it doesn't make us perfect. We stumble, we sin, we make mistakes. But ladies and gentlemen, he that hath begun a good work in you will bring it to pass. He has started something in your heart. He wants to transform you from day to day to day like the caterpillar turning into the free and beautiful butterfly. God wants to create something beautiful in you. 
metamorpho. He says, if we'll resolve to surrender our lives and renew our minds, while at the same time refusing to conform to worldly standards, we will experience the metamorphing power of God in our lives. It means to be changed from the inside out. The Holy Spirit works in and through us, making us more like Christ every day. <clears throat> that change will enable, will enable us to experience God's perfect and pleasing will in our lives. That's the benefit of surrender. To experience the perfect and pleasing will of God in our lives. Living a life that fulfills God's purposes and finds God pleased. Hebrews 11.5 talks about a man in the Bible named Enoch. The Bible says Enoch had this testimony that his life pleased God. Do you know that Enoch did not face physical death? Well, I mean, not in the sense that we probably all will. He didn't go out by the way of the grave. The Bible says in Genesis 5, he was not, for God took him. In other words, it'd be like you just walking down the street and all of a sudden you're gone. You long way gone, friend. Because listen, God just put his hand down and took him. It means he disappeared. It's a pre-type or a prefigure of the rapture that is to come. I believe in a rapture. A lot of people don't. How are you going to get to heaven? <clears throat> Well, anyhow, you're going to have to be changed. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. This mortal can't inherit immortality. This corruptible can't put on the incorruptible. You've got to be changed, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Something's got to happen to you. That's the rapture. One of these days, my dear friend, there's coming a shout from the other side. And the glory of the Lord and the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God is going to sound. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a rapture we call it. Enoch was walking along and just God took him. His life was so pleasing to God, God raptured him out. You see, we look at life from the wrong perspective. We see a journey that begins at the cradle and ends at the grave. We look at life as being a progression and certainly one hopes that it's pleasant perhaps, but that's not always the case, we know. Life is not always pleasant. I mean, we prayed for a girl Wednesday night who had a heart transplant. She's facing complications with the heart transplant. The doctors came in, told her mom and dad. A, a few days later, she's eat up with lymphoma. She's nine years old. We don't understand that. You see, we see life going that way. But you know, on the other side, on the other shore, they see life coming toward them. <laughs> we see life going away, but they see life coming toward them. That's why the Bible says we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses and they're cheering us on. Hang on, hold on, keep walking, stay strong, stand in the faith because one of these days you're going to cross over. You see, Enoch lived such a life that God just took him right on to heaven. He pleased God. Think about that. I have tried... I have tried to live a life that would please God. My daddy, I talk a lot about him. He's been gone a while now. When I started preaching, he looked at me and said, Cheryl, here's the only thing I'm going to tell you, son. He said, you preach this book straight down the line. And he said, God will take care of the rest. He said, son, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hillsides. He will take care of you. God forbid that I preach anything except the gospel of Jesus 
and the Word of God. You see, I can't please you even if I tried. We'll never necessarily always please one another. Oh, we may have moments where we do, but when I'm talking about this, when I'm talking about the Word and the Gospel, we just can't please everybody. Not even in the church. We certainly can't please the world. We can't even please everybody in the church. So what do we do? We should strive to please God. God is your Creator. He made you with a purpose in mind and seeking to live according to that purpose results in a sense of completion. That brings us to a place of peace and contentment. It is only when we surrender to Christ that we enjoy the abundant life of Christ. In this passage is a call to surrender, a reason to surrender, and the results of surrender that you might live a life that would please God. On March the 10th, 1974, 30 years almost after the end of World War II, Lieutenant Hiro Onoda finally handed over his rusty sword and became the last Japanese soldier to surrender. Onoda had been sent to the tropical island of Lubang in the Philippines in 1944. He was sent there with orders to conduct guerrilla warfare and to prevent enemy attack on the island. When the war ended, Onada refused to believe that the mess he refused to believe the messages announcing Japan's surrender. He wouldn't believe it. For 29 years, Long after his fellow soldiers had surrendered or been killed, Onada continued defending the island territory for the defeated Japanese army. He hid in the jungle, lived off the land, he stole food and supplies from local citizens. He evaded one search party after another. He killed at least 30 nationals in the process. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent trying to locate the lone holdout and convince him that the war was over. Leaflets were dropped, newspapers, photographs, letters from friends were dropped in the jungle. Announcements were made over loudspeakers begging him to surrender. Still he refused to give up the fight. Some 13,000 men had been deployed in the effort before Onoda finally received a personal command from his former commander that persuaded him to give up. They got the old man to come. And tell him, son, listen, the war's over. In his autobiography, which was entitled, No Surrender, My 30-Year War, Onada describes the moment that the reality of what had transpired began to sink in. Listen to what he said. I felt like a fool. What had I been doing for all these years? For the first time, I really understood this was the end. I pulled back the bolt on my rifle and unloaded the bullets. I eased off the pack that I always carried with me. And I laid the gun down. The war was finally over. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever consciously acknowledged Christ's ownership of your life? Have you made a volitional, unconditional, lifetime surrender of your life to Christ? Are you seeking to live out that surrender day by day? Are there areas of your life over which you reserve the right to exercise control? Are you seeking to put God first in all areas of your life? Now listen, I know this is a tall order. And I want to say to you, I've not arrived yet myself. But I want to surrender every day. I want to roll out of my bed onto my knees and say, Lord, this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Father, help me to live and walk by faith and surrender to you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the beginning of revival. Your time, your service, your giving, your thoughts, your actions, your words. I say to you tonight, it's time to surrender. The war needs to be over. 
Would you pray with us? I always end this message singing the song that we're going to sing as our invitation hymn tonight. So I'm not going to sing for you. We're going to sing together. I Surrender All, page 275. Tonight, dear friend, I just want to ask that you take a moment and just reflect. Think about the words of the Apostle. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect, pleasing will of God. Heavenly Father, I pray not just for those who heard this message, but for this one who preached the message. I pray, Father, that I will truly live a life of surrender. I want to please you, Lord. And I pray tonight that you speak to our hearts here, Father, at Skyline, whether it's home folk or visitors tonight, Lord, I just pray that you draw us closer to yourself and draw us to that place of full surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, shall we? I'm going to be here, pastor's here. You come tonight, would you, while we sing? If you need to come and pray about anything, just slip out and come. Amen. God bless you. Just come on now. Just come on. Just come and take these things to the Lord. If you need us to pray with you, we certainly will. But you obey the Lord tonight. I surrender Would you come? Many are still coming. What about you? Would there be others? While she plays for just a moment, we're going to sing one more verse and then pastor will come. But let me just say something to you tonight. Many have come already. Thank God for you. I just want you to know something. I've I've sort of um, amplified my perspective of revival over the years. You know, we all want to see local church revival, local community revival. Sure, national revival, God willing, that would be wonderful. But let me tell you something. If revival takes place in only your heart, that is still revival. And that is a place to start. So I don't know if you're holding back or hesitating. This is for you. Why don't you slip out? Come and pray.